the Master Chef's episode. Have you ever thought of starting your own home-based food business or maybe even set up your own hawker store or restaurant? If you secretly say yes, you must listen to this episode twice. Hi, this is Eric here and you're listening to Hashtag Highly Sought After. My guest today was one of the top five finalists in the MasterChef series here in Singapore. Last year, during the COVID pandemic, he launched his very first hawker store selling bihun kueh, and it became a hawker sensation here in Singapore. Long queues, food sell by 1 to 2 p.m., raving reviews from top local food bloggers. And as of this interview, he has already opened four more stores with two more on its way. So there's a lot we can learn from him on how we can market our food brand. So Aaron, I got a you difficult doing? question. Good I'm good. I, I just, I just <laughs> ate your bihun kueh. Really? Yes. Fresh bihun kueh. How is it? Lo don't, okay. don't say it just because I'm here. Yeah. No, no, Honestly. no, no. I wouldn't Honestly. say that. All it right. was really good. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Because um, number one, I'm biased. Bihun kueh is one of my favorite dishes. That's great. But number two is I like that it's very fresh. Perfect. That, um, you know, you order already, right? Then yeah. the person will take and make. You do it on the spot. I like you do it on the spot, yeah. right? Yeah. And I like that meatball. That meatball has a lot one. of love in it. Oh, yeah. right? It's just like, I mean, a lot of guys, when they have meatballs, they have a lot of fillers. Yeah. They add all kinds of like flour and all that. Ours is just meat and nothing else. Plus seasoning, of course. And that prawn ball. Oh, that one was 100% prawn. Okay, plus seasoning. Yeah, yeah. but it yeah. kind of reminds me of the very atas high tea lao. It is, it is oh, exactly. Oh, you modern that. Yeah, it's exactly. Because we always order yeah. the prawn thingy that is very it, expensive, 30 it, plus it's dollars. almost exactly the same thing. So, okay, guys, right. we, we have just... Uh, by the way, there's, there's going to be B-roll for that. We took okay. videos of the food just now, earlier that we ate. Great. You should have told me if you were you're uh, coming. No, 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 right. we didn't want to. We All just right. want to come and support. Okay. Um, but I have to say that... Okay, first, let me start a difficult question okay. or a fun question for you. If you were to describe yourself mm -hmm. with a dish, <laughs> <laughs> what would you Myself. use as a dish? Yeah. I think it is, I mean, it's coming to me almost immediately. Like, I don't know if it's right, but I'll say Roja. Roja, why? Because it's a mix of everything. Uh. I mean, I'm a photographer. Mm. I'm also, I'm mean, a commercial photographer, so I do advertising stuff and all that. Uh, and I'm a professional diver which is actually completely different already. And then now I'm doing, you know, all this F&B stuff, which, you know, nothing kind of fits, but I just enjoy them all. So uh, nothing, it's not one fixed thing. So it's just a jumbo where everything throw together, mix it in a pot and see what and comes out. And that sweet sauce is what yeah. passion. <laughs> yeah, passion is probably, what brought you know, everything together. See what comes out the other end, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm. I love the answer. Yeah, love it's a bit crazy, answer. yeah. Uh, you know, I was looking at all your videos and all, right? Uh -huh. uh, what, what, what really stood out for me was that you said you're self-taught. Almost everything. Yeah, exactly. In fact, yeah, almost everything. So, like, what was the very first dish do you still remember cooking? I wouldn't say the first dish, but maybe the first dish I could remember being good at. Yeah. Uh, is this this oyster chicken, oh, mayo tea lah. Sesame oil chicken. Sesame oil chicken, yeah, oil chicken yeah. with a clay pot but, pan, right? but it's mostly oyster sauce lah. It's just okay. one pot, chicken wing, you know, a lot of meat wings. And then, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's very difficult to mess that one up, but that's probably why I did it so well. Then I, I remember this one of the first few dishes that I could, you know, technically feed people with. Like. And, <laughs> Nobody and died why, from it. Why do you think that was your best dish at that point? Is it because you follow a certain recipe uh, or, or? My grandfather actually, my, my grandfather, he's Hainanese, right? So, yeah. you know, a Hainanese man cook one. Huh? So um, my first image of anybody standing in the kitchen, the whole concept of cooking, like, yeah. you know, how food go from meat to a dish is looking at my granddad. I mean, when you're a kid, when you go to a hawker center, you don't see people cook, right? Yeah, you, you, the food just arrives. But my whole you know, concept of seeing someone put a dish together is actually my granddad. Uh, and he cooks a lot. And this is one of his stuff. The other one is, of course, Luro Fana. But mm. so you see where he's going. It's always this very gravy. Very savory. Yeah, yeah, gra very, gravy. Yeah, a lot of law. La, all, lot. The kind of stuff la, like black soy sauce. Saucy. Yeah, correct. His kind of stuff. La, so I'm very influenced. By that, so I I make the uh, chicken wing very well. I started with that, and then I I did the um the what do you call it the luro fan also la, the law bar la, Great. Well, uh, so. Let me explain because we have people not from uh, Singapore, right? Yeah. So luro fan na, it's, it's like braised uh, pork belly. Yes, braised pork yeah. belly with a lot of rice and a lot of brown sauce. Yeah, it's very, very a lot of dark gravy. Uh, I mean, 
We'll have a picture of, uh, uh, and video later yeah, coming up for that. It, it's yeah. a lot of lard in it. It's a lot of skin, but it's very, very tender. It falls off the bone kind of uh, tender. I forgot to do a disclaimer just now at the intro that you should never listen to this episode if, if or you're watch hungry, this yeah. if you're hungry in the <laughs> middle of the night. Kids, don't watch this when you're hungry or, you know. Yeah, don't. don't. You need food. <laughs> listen to us uh, <laughs> while you're eating your yeah. roll fun, your lunch. So, Aaron, you joined season one of Master mm. Chef. Season one, you yeah. know, wow. It's not... I, I mean, pioneer. Yeah, you're the pioneer. Yeah. How did it happen? Like, do you always knew that you would join Master Chef one day? I'll be totally honest, not at all, right? Uh, it was more or less like a, more of a one thing led to the another, another mm. kind of situation. Right? Because first of all, it was season one, so mm. it was a big thing. Everybody, oh, finally, she's yeah. in Singapore, and then and everybody's talking about it. And I was having a drink literally with some friends, and it just popped on one of my feet, right? And then my friends saying like, "Hey, dude, you need to go. You know, why don't you try it out?" And he says that because I'm the I'm the I'm the food guy within the group. Yeah. You know, in a group of friends, you always have the guy who books the movie tickets, you have Correct. the guy who organizes stuff, the guy who brings the booze. I'm the guy who takes care of the food, right? So we um, always need a friend like that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so yeah. you always get one guy who's like, oh food, he'll take care of it. If you wanna go watch a movie, this guy was gonna buy the tickets, you know. It's always an uh, unsaid rule. So I'm the food guy, and naturally they say, you know, dude, why don't you just give it a shot? And then I thought about it. We were having drinks, I'm like, I know what, forget it. And then I thought about it a bit more and they yeah. made the entire application process quite simple. You know, you just basically sign on, like fill in your name. This is the first round. And then send I know what's the worst that can yeah. happen, right? It's free. And then I think a couple of weeks or maybe a, a week or two later, they gave me another, sent me another email saying, oh, we'd like to know you more. And then that's where they ask for more information, you know, your, your social media, they want to see who you are, what you represent. And then I thought, okay, still, you know, what can I lose, right? Yeah. So sent that over and then it was the second or third uh, correspondence and then finally got very real when they asked you down for an interview. <gasps> okay. And I'm like, you know, this stuff is, this is really happening, right? Yeah. So uh, I'll be honest, I'm thinking of like, oh, now this is getting real. I don't even know if I want to do it, you know, to be very honest yeah. because- Like the whole Singapore will be looking yeah, at Yeah, like, are you really, do you want to put yourself out there? Because I'm not a chef, you know, yeah. like, I mean, I cook at home for friends. Like, what do I know about, you know, cooking for others? And, and I mean, if you watch the show, you know, I, I'm not a fan of fancy food. You know, mm. I'm just a local boy. Mm. So what do I know about this elevated, uh, 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 you know, restaurant level stuff? I said, you know, and on top of that, it was quite a commitment. It was a over three weeks uh, commitment, like at a go, right? So you need to fall off the surface of this planet for three weeks. <laughs> and we didn't have our phones. If you want to know, I mean- Yeah, fun, they don't allow uh, you to Yeah, record. fun facts, uh, fun uh. fact uh, about MasterChef is, uh, you, you're not allowed to have your phone. So um, for a lot of reasons, you know, secrecy and all the, the NDAs, you know, non-disclosure, and it's very uh, 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 serious. So technically you can't have a life for three weeks. So whatever you have planned, you know, you have to put it to a halt. I mean, uh, some of my fellow contestants actually uh, quit their job just to be just on MasterChef. Be on yeah, because there's no other way you could do it. So, it, I mean, but I guess that step is important because it, it weeds out all the not committed ones. Exactly, you know? yeah, they, they just yeah, try, yeah, try, try you know? let's go for fun, you know. So they really want to make sure, no, listen, if you want to come in, um, you need to be very serious. And so I did, and I mean, the rest is history. Yeah. Like, what was, the, I'm very curious, like what was the interview process? Like you said that they, they invited you down, was it just a Q&A or they make you cook something on the spot? Uh, okay, I will tell you, uh, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say, but I think it's fine, you know, I think it's fine. So basically the interview, the audition, right, is uh, they, they make you cook a dish in a setting that is very similar to the show, not the real one. And then there are cameras. Uh, I don't think they're rolling because I'm in this industry. I know I'm a photographer. It, the cameras are not rolling, right? But they just the cameras see are there. Uh. And then there are people asking all the time a lot of questions and all that. Like, you know, what are you doing now? Can you explain while you are doing this and you have one hour to prepare a dish of your choice? Right? So that's the easy part. You can do whatever you want to do. And of course, you need to impress them with um, the dish. Of course, it needs to be good. And also they want to see how you work on TV, you know, yeah, really, can, can, yeah can you deliver the lines uh -huh. and all that. Uh, and then a lot of process, then we had to go for medical and all that, you know, to make sure you have fit. Fit for the show. Yeah, and mentally sound. Wow. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not even joking, a, a psych evaluation uh, in case whether you can handle the stress and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So because this is a real, uh, it's a really serious cook show. It's like I the mean, Olympics for the cooking world. Huh? Kind of, I, and everything, I mean, if there's any, you know, I know the folks at home watching this, uh, they want to know if, uh, how real this is. I'll tell you now, as a matter of fact, that everything you see on the show is real, right? So we only 
know what we're going to cook on at the exact moment. We, Do you we, get to go home or you have to stay in some we kind get of hostel? To go home. Okay. We get to go home for a Singapore show, but I mean, other like the Australian ones, I know for a fact, they have to stay in a, in a hotel together. But Singapore being the size we are, yeah, you can always so come we back go home. home. So we are fortunate that way. Uh, but you, you have no idea what they're going to throw at you and you have no reference of anything. It means you, you don't have your phone, uh, you don't have any uh, notes that you yeah. can bring in. So yeah. you technically must know everything, right? Oh. If I want to say, buddy, let's, I want you to bake a cake. You have to bake at least one cake. You need to know one of everything. If I want you to make a curry, uh, you make a curry. And I'm not talking about tear open some yeah, ready yeah, mix. Yeah, yeah, instant mix. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Pour some coconut. No, man, make From a curry. Scratch. That's the galangal, that's the ginger, and here are some turmeric, you know? Gosh. Then you got to pound and make a curry, like how curry is supposed to be made. You need to know one of everything. So may I know how you prepared for that? So when, okay, first of all, when you got selected, right? Mm -hmm. So they emailed you or something, mm -hmm. how, what was your first emotion? Yeah, I again, I was saying, I, maybe I don't want to do it. Then I realized, wow, well, this is one out of, I'm, I have one slot out of 20, mm. you know, out of the whole Singapore who got it. Uh, if I don't do well, or I'm not putting uh, my heart and soul in, into this, right? Uh, it's actually depriving someone else of this exactly. opportunity. Exactly, wow, well said. So I'm thinking, okay, if I'm going to do it, I got to make sure I try. Yes. But then I'm this abeng local boy, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't even know anything about any, I mean, let's talk about French food, right? Like, what do I know about all this? Yeah. And, you know, but my contestants are, the rest of my fellow contestants, they're very different. They're really into it. They're, you know, they know all the names of everything. And, and I'm just thinking, oh, I'm not going to do well in this, you know. But then, I felt maybe this would have been a good opportunity to showcase what we are about as Singaporeans, right? Fantastic. Like, yeah, like, yeah. Just do our version of everything, like, you know, we try our best. Then again, uh, is this mentality of, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Hey, and I just want to plug something in. Uh, mm. I read on, on the internet, right, that our dear friend Aaron was actually number one in the first challenge. Yes. Yeah, so don't don't pray, pray <laughs> huh? okay? He can might not be like a professional chef or what, but he makes Singaporeans proud. Well, I can, I can because feel- Because you show local food, right? Yeah, I, and I, I can feel this in a little bit. Actually, ah. I was the top scorer of the entire show because they had, I think a total of uh, eight episodes, if, yes. I, if I remember correctly, eight episodes. I was in six of them. I won five of the challenges. So, and it was in a row. So it, it, it became uh, very stressful. Yes, right? I wanted to ask yeah. you that. How do you feel? Like it's everybody's watching you. And it's very crazy because the first one was nice. Because <laughs> like, oh, look at this. And then the yeah. second one was like, oh, this is pretty good. I'm this on the road. Yeah. And then the third and fourth and then winning all the team challenges. And, you know, then, you know, Twitter kind of exploded. I didn't even have a Twitter account, I'll be honest. I, I don't know what it's about. Like, I know yeah. what Twitter is, but I just don't like it. It's not my generation. And what, you, what do you mean by you say Twitter exploded? What people are talking about yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they say, oh, this guy's going to win. So then there's all this pressure, you know, and then of course, during the show, it is still a competition. Uh, the contestants, uh, we are still very good friends. We love each other to death. Oh, nice. Up to now, we still meet up in, just, so uh, cool. in our uh, houses, uh, different uh, houses. And we hang out, we have potluck and all that before COVID, of course. Oh, wouldn't, wouldn't I kill to be with one of those potluck? Can yeah. you imagine, guys? The, all the our the chef. amount of food. Yeah. yeah. Okay, anyway. But we were never, you know, like trying to dig each, other, each other's eyeballs out. None of that. Uh, but there is still a competitive element in, Good. in, in okay. the air. Yeah. So it's stressful, la. you know, you win one or two, then, you know, everybody eyes on you, cameras on you. Like, what's it? Then you feel like almost you can't fail. You know. Yeah. yeah how do you just, feel? Yeah. Like, how do you mentally prepare for that show then? Uh, honestly, after a few days of filming, I just realized the best way to prepare for this uh, is to not prepare seriously, because <laughs> I believe a lot of yeah. students have the same same philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Because if you are still thinking about it, if it's going to start filming, I mean, you can't possibly prepare for something. You don't even know, right? Yeah, what that you cook. don't know what's going to happen. And I feel that if you keep trying to think of what you can do, and then when the challenge comes, you will try to tailor that challenge to fit something you already know. You get what I'm trying to say? Yeah, you overdo it, right? Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I have to say that, I mean, and, and that's not humble bragging or what, but you must have a certain talent, right? Because for you not to know what to cook and you are able to emerge, is it because you have a lot of experience in cooking or you really just have a flair for it? I, I Just a bit of flair, I think. I think you need to have that to, to be in a show like this. Wait, but, when you say flair, what? Your communication skills kind of flair, like you have very good showmanship or mm, like your, the way you do your food is different. I think just the cooking part. Yeah, the cooking part. I mean, 
for me maybe it was a little bit easier because I'm I'm used to cameras. So oh, maybe yeah, because I'm a photographer. I mean, being in a studio, being in this setting here is home. is my home. You know, yeah. I I know all this equipment, right? Um, <laughs> so when I got to the, here's a funny story. When I got to the set of Master Chef, there's so many crew, right? Because there's something like twelve cameras rolling at one go. And when some of the crew saw me, I know these guys. I work with them. They're like, hey bro, you covering steals today? Yeah? And they're like, no, I'm not covering steals. Bloody contestant, nah. Like, Shit, no way. No. <laughs> so funny because I work with this guy, so it's very natural for me. Yeah. So when when the filming starts, you know, it goes and stand by action. You know, everybody, boom, cameraman running around. I, I'm sure it's quite nerve wracking for some of the yes. fellow contestants Correct. who are not used to these things. Correct. Right. But for me, it's like, you know, I'm just no, it's normal for me. So I guess there's a bit of an advantage there. Um, but short of that, like your, your question was like, how do I prepare? So I just don't because I gave up. I realized that I keep thinking, wow, if I have a chicken, I'll do this. Blah, 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 blah. Then when you <laughs> have that challenge, yep. and the challenge will usually not be a product, uh, a, a, a kind of protein. It's like, oh, do this. But because you're so focused on chicken or whatever that is, then you just want to tailor it into a chicken, you know? And then when you go into the pantry, you don't even know if there's going to be chicken in the pantry. So yeah. you kind of set yourself Correct. So sense. yeah, exactly. So you have to tunnel vision because you prepared too much. And you prevent yourself from being creative. Because exactly. a lot of times it's in the flow, yeah. right? Yeah, you box yourself in without knowing it. This is beautiful stuff. Yeah. Uh, were there any memorable moments in that in that oh, five episode you were in? A lot, man. I mean, the first one is probably like we like you mentioned, the first win. I mean, because that was the point that tipped the scale, right? Because prior everything that happened before that was, I think I'm pretty good. I like what I cook, but hey, what the hell do I know about what's nice? Maybe I'm wrong. But all my friends say it's nice. But then again, they are my friends. friends. My family say they are nice too. But again, that's family. So to feed experts, you know, like judges, how is it going to fare? So when you win the first one, I think that gives a lot of a vote of confidence. And you make you feel like, ah, okay, all right, now we're talking, you know, like, oh, yeah. I, I can actually do this. Yes. So that's that. If you ask me that, that pivotal moment, that kind of, Assurance. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Then, of course, the rest of the memories are really the behind the scenes stuff with the fellow contestants, which I told you we were still we are still very very good friends. And a lot of the times, I know for a fact that um, the producers and you know, all the directors want some drama. Oh, but unfortunately, we are not the US version where we want to dig each other's eyeballs out. Yeah. You know, we, we <laughs> we are just very mellow and very love. Like, you know? okay, oh, you don't cook this. Like, Zema, yeah, just yeah. After that, we are not bickering about anything. We are going in and giving each other's. Uh, uh, giving each other a lot of uh, encouragement, you know, it's completely different from what I very expect. wholesome, exactly. Inter- very wholesome episode. Yeah, but it's very twisted because you know, for every challenge that you go in, you're gonna come back with one guy less. Yeah, it's like Squid Game, man. You know oh what I mean? like, my god, yeah, it's you're like, right. It's like your friends are, but you know, going in there, that my main job is to make sure you don't come back. Yep. Right. So, um, so that's the the messed up, but but that's re- that's, that's that's the reality, reality right? I mean, life is like yeah. that too, right? Correct, yeah. How do you feel when you you because you were at rank five, right? If I yeah. recall, how do you feel like everybody oh, when, is rooting for you to win this whole thing? When I got eliminated, yeah. You know, oh, I tell you, I'm I'm not trying to be sore about it, but I think that was the best way to get eliminated. I'll explain why okay. because I won so many of the challenges. Yes, before. and it's consecutive. Yeah. Uh, but because of one very simple reason, because I don't follow rules, right? Because I, you know, who says it must be like that? Well, I, but to begin with, I don't even know the rules because I didn't go to any culinary school, right? I didn't know I was doing it wrong. Yeah, Aaron right? is self-taught that by the yeah, way, guys. So, um, look, if it's sweet, it's sweet. If it's nice, it's nice. Who cares how it was made, right? So not following the rules, the rebel, yada, yada. And then came that challenge. And that challenge is a, a replication challenge. So what they basically did is they give you a, a recipe book. Never read a recipe book in my life, right? <laughs> I'm not even joking. I watch YouTube, right? You don't, you say no, you go agaration and I, I, I don't, I don't own a single recipe book. I'm, I'm saying this in front of the camera. I don't own one, right? So I watch YouTube or how to do this. I mean, I'd rather somebody tell me how it works than I'm reading half a cup of this, you know, three measures of that, like, Shit, who gives it, you know, right? So then this challenge came with a serious recipe book. I'm like, oh, shit. GG. Yeah, that's yeah. I'm, I'm fucked right here, man. <laughs> so I wasn't able to follow a very clean, all the items measured for you. All you need to do is put it in order as per what the recipe says. How can you mess this up? But I just can't do it because I, I 
Don't wow. follow. It, now I understand why you say that in some way, it's actually a very nice way to exit. Yeah, exactly. Because your brand is a rebel, you go yeah. by your feelings yeah. and, and the yeah. episode essentially, I mean, yeah. naturally you'll fail, right? Because yeah, you yeah. don't follow um, rules. Yeah. Correct. Because I, I just follow who I was. I, I mean, I, I mean, in hindsight, of course, I wish I did a better job, but because when the when they say, okay, your time starts now and the clock starts moving, all your strategy and all that goes to hell because all of a sudden you're in the moment. So you naturally just do what you are good at doing. Yeah. At some point, you would just- Go back just, to that yeah, default. Correct, go yeah. back to that default setting. And I would just, I was just, oh, just it's just silly, la, but it's good fun. No, it's it's great. It was yeah. great, nice, yeah. entertaining it's a, it's watching a, you. It's a very nice way to end up, sum up the whole thing. And then we, I, and now we had to apologize to Singapore. Uh, sorry guys. <laughs> Why apologize? I don't get it. Because there's a lot of people, man. I'm They're disappointed, yeah, exactly. right? Yeah, because so many of us were rooting for you. I mean, there are kids watching this show that wants me to win. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I messed up your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. And um, now, so 2018 was that competition, Correct. right? Then you started your very first store. Uh, uh, last year. Last year. Last year. Mm. So there was a gap of two years. What were you doing? After uh, after you, you left MasterChef? Okay, right after the show, yes. there were a lot of people wanting to collect. Yeah, yeah, correct. and then okay. there were endorsements and all that stuff. Um, but in the end of the day, I'm still a photographer, right? That's my job, my studio, my business. I've been a photographer for 20, 20 years, twenty two years at that time, right? So, it's, I'm, I I realized that I'm not going to do anything else, right? And but I did do a few uh, pop ups and other in restaurants, collaborations with other chefs. Um, so, you know, I went through the entire process doing all the fine dining stuff, big plate, very small food, wow, very pretty, take one tweezer. Ah, uh, they must like that. Yeah, they must. <laughs> I did that all, you know, I mean, like, you know, customers sitting right in front of you, watching you do every little thing and <laughs> wear a chef jacket, you know, atas until, wow, your name on it. Yeah. But I just didn't like it. And I just, again, no offense to uh, these guys who do yeah. all this. I mean, they're all masters, but it's just not my stuff. Yeah, it's right? not you. I, I just feel that food should be very honest. Uh, it shouldn't be so fluffed up and so wayang, you know. Just, it is what it is. It should be kept simple. And I'm a local, but I like this kind of local flavors. That's it. So I tried a few of that. I didn't like it. So I stopped there. And um, yeah, so I wasn't expecting to do anything uh, until COVID, you know. So COVID was a trigger? Yes. Well, I, I read some, I don't know if I read somewhere or I watched it somewhere, okay, but it, it came from somebody else. So I'm just saying, I'm, I am paraphrasing here. I'm just using someone's line, okay? You know what COVID has done? It has literally made liars of us all. Why do I say that? Because for the longest time in our lives, we always say, if we had the time, we would do this, do that, right? That's our go-to excuse. I'll get our jail free card. It's like, if I had the time, I would uh, learn a new instrument or pick up a new language, something, you know, clean the house, you know, whatever. But now <laughs> with COVID, especially during the circuit breaker, we have all the time in the world. How come you never realize any of your dreams? Oh, good one. Yeah. So you've been lying to yourself all this while because all the time I'm saying, I'm busy making money, shooting, you know, I'm going to make a living, you think the petrol free, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm going to pay the house, you know, blah, 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 blah. you know, I'm going to F&B. Uh, okay, like, if really all else fails, I've got, if I have the time, okay, I would open a hawker store, right? <laughs> and then now, you know, COVID slaps you with all the time you need. Then I'm thinking, you know, if not now, then quite frankly, when? when? Yeah. And I know a lot of people saying, you know, COVID, you know, it's also uncertain and all that. It is uncertain in F&B in general, but it depends on which sector you're talking about. If you're in the restaurant business, then seriously, guys, um, they're having a really hard time. Yeah. Okay, it's really difficult. And I understand completely. But if you're talking about like what I'm, what I'm saying in the hawker, you know, food and you know, coffee shops and all that, those are staple, you know, that's the backbone of the industry. And I, I, I mean, I hope touch wood, uh, <clears throat> but I don't, here. Yeah, I don't <laughs> see how we will stop having hawker food. Yeah. You know what I mean? You get yeah, what I'm saying? That, that's we we can't close it down because yeah. if there comes a day where a hawker or, or f coffee shop has to close down, yeah. We lose a very big part of our identity. No, as in like, we will be, that's it, man, bro, end game. Right, think about it. Restaurants close down, yes. Cannot dine in, yes. But if there comes a day, they have to shut down all the food centers, means people cannot eat already, no? Correct, no? Yeah. That is very serious. That is uh, literally, Li Shenlong will probably go on TV and say, don't argue, just yeah. go home and be with your families. Gosh, it's probably yeah. apocalypse. Yeah, it's apocalypse. <laughs> By the time the most basic source of 
food has to be shut down, then we are in a lot of trouble. And by then, nothing would really matter, would it? Yeah, So true. So, okay, in, in some ways, being a hawker is a really secured yeah. uh, sector of FMB. It's not doing as good as it was before, but then again, I don't think it will ever die. Yeah. Because that is sustenance. Right. I agree. Yeah. And and you think about it, like the, the period of time where we cannot go out and eat, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of weird. There's no more reason to go out because mm -hmm. we go out to eat. Correct. You know, and then we lose that part yeah. of us. But I'm very curious, like, um, so I get why hawker, we are, we're, we'll talk a lot about the hawker culture okay. and, you know, your vision as well for the hawker industry. Mm -hmm. But why Bihun <laughs> Kuei? Wow. A By the way, we have to explain to yeah. our viewers not from Singapore, okay. right? What is bihun kueh? Can we try? Bihun kueh is basically, well, Asian pasta. You are good. Think about it, right? Yeah. Just minus the egg. Right? It's just flour and water. Uh, it originated as a, what's the right way to call it? Peasant food, lah, right? Because it's very basic. Yeah. You know, our forefathers came across from China uh, and they had flour, they had water, they had some uh, anchovies, you know, we call them ikan bilis, and small little fried fillers. And then they just cook some basic soup and then pro uh, give you a lot of carbs lah, because yeah. they need to work, right? They yeah. are all working the dogs, coolies and all kinds of stuff, so a lot of energy. So they had to carb, load the carbs in. So flour, lah, right? Make noodles. And then instead of cooling these noodles, which requires skill, they just roll it down. The original traditional myung kueh is a ball of dough and they literally pinch it out. It's actually yeah. more lumpy than what we are doing now. Yeah, um, but ours, of course, we roll it through a pasta machine, machine yeah. and then we tear it by hand still. So we are still very close to the original, just slightly more consistent. Mm. So that's what it is. It's hand-torn pasta, Asian version. I love that. Yeah. Oh my God, I'm going to tell all my foreign <laughs> friends that. Like, that's the Bihun Asian Kui. version. The Asian yeah. version. Uh, okay, Chinese pasta. Yeah. So why this Asian version? <laughs> uh, first of all, I like it. So mm. it's, to me, it's a meal that I enjoy. High five. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Because I, I don't think you can cook something with passion if you don't bloody like it. True. Okay, you can say all you want, but I think that's at least the baseline you need to have. Um, as for <laughs> why, I mean, but then again, I like a lot of other food. Yeah. Okay. But Mi Hun Kueh falls into this category of comfort food. Right. But then again, I also have a lot of other comfort food. Yeah. But Mi Hun Kueh actually is one of the more unique ones. Think about it. Because I, I mean, I do a very... Uh, a, a, a solid uh, wonton meat, for example, mm. and the luro fan, for example, noodles, yeah, all this stuff. Braised pork rice, correct, yeah. Um, but if you look at wonton the dumpling noodles, it's very common. The market is saturated with it. Um, there is one in every single hawker center you go to. Period, right? Um, but if you talk about mihun kueh, um, I would say a more specialized mihun kueh store, you don't really get much. I think that really maybe can count in with five hands yeah. certain brands, right? Yeah, correct. I'm not going to say the brands, yeah, but that few. Yes, you can get Mihun Kueh at um, uh, a, lot, a lot of other places, but they are always, oh, by the way, we have Mihun Kueh. It's mm. like fish soup, ban Yeah, it's not like you go somewhere yeah, just to just have Mihun, for Mihun Kueh. Kueh. Exactly. So Mihun Kueh <laughs> sometimes feels like it's almost like an afterthought. You know, if I have Ban Mi and I have this, 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 oh, by the way, yeah, I have oh. Mihun Kueh too. But they're not specialized. So to have a specialized Mihun Kueh store, uh, a little bit more unique. You know, I, uh, by the way, I, I, I think right at the start of the episode, I talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. That we, we felt that it would be very weird if we don't try a bihun kueh before the interview. Right? <laughs> yeah. And I felt like, no, I have bihun kueh in my tummy right now. Mm -hmm. it's, okay. it's a very wholesome, very homely kind yeah. of food. Yeah. So Especially with the weather today. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, today perfect. Cooling, cooling weather, weather, right? right? Yeah, yeah. bihun kueh weather. Hot soup. So yeah. guys, if you're listening to this episode, go get it, okay? So let, let's do a quick plug in first before mm -hmm. we talk a bit, a bit about business. Where are they? Where can we find them? Oh, by the way, the name of your, your hawker store, it's called Jiak Song, which is Hokkien, right? It's a mm, dialect. Yeah. Mm. So would you like to tell us what is Jiak Song? Jiak Song is, uh, again, uh, like what you mentioned, uh, Jia is basically eat, eat right? Okay. Song, song is a, is a Singapore slang. Shook. Uh, yeah, shook, you know, it's strong. Feels good. Uh, so it feels good. So it's, it, to loosely, lamely translate it, it's like it feels good after eating. Ah, right. So guys, Let's just put it this way. If you want to feel good yeah. about so your food. So it's Jia Song, J-I-A-K-S-O-N-G. We'll try that. Mi Hung Kui. Kui. Uh, we have Where? four outlets. Uh, we we'll have the original one in Tolo Blanga Crescent. You, you can, might actually end up seeing Aaron because he stays around there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you, I mean, I don't want to list out the entire uh, address. I can't remember anyway as well. <laughs> but just Google uh, Jia Song Mi Hung Kui, Tolo Blanga. Yeah. Or Jia Song Mi Hung Kui, Bedok. Okay, or Jia Song Mi Hung Kui, Tampines. Or Jia Song Mi Hung Kui, Queen Street. Wait, wait, wait. Queen Street, where is that? That's Bugis. 
Bugis ah, it is Bugis, area. but oh, the actual street. The one street, that we yeah. just went. Okay, yeah, correct. Queen but street. the actual name is uh, the, the street is Queen Street. Queen Street, which is at yeah. Bugis. Correct. Okay. Uh, not fair. What's happening to the north, which is where I stay, and what's happening to the west? <laughs> are you going to do something for those two places? We are coming yes. soon. North to Hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm looking, um, but it's interesting because, especially, okay, since we are talking about this, yes, yes. one thing that you guys also want to know is that to get into a hawker store, uh, how's it like? Uh, it requires uh, a bit of work because uh, not only must you find the right place, the right location, the right traffic, uh, price must be right. More importantly, um, the store must not have something that's conflicting. Oh. Uh, so, so a lot of my friends are like, oh, when are you coming to this? Yeah, I would like to, but it's so difficult to find the right spot because if that, if that particular hawker store or the coffee shop has a, for example, a ban mian, the owners of the hawk, uh, the, that coffee shop might not want you to come in. I see. Mm, okay. Correct. They don't want to antagonize correct. their, their, their yeah. other hawker. Yeah. Okay. So if you, so guys, if you want to come into the hawker industry and you want to do wonton mee, right? For example, dumpling noodles, uh, chashu, all this. Forget it. Forget it. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's very difficult. No, but I'll do, I'll do my job. That means, you see, okay, so very simple, guys. Those of you listening or watching, mm -hmm. right? You want, the, especially the local Singaporeans, uh, you want Tiak Song to be with you. You help him also, right? Start looking out for locations <laughs> yes. that doesn't have a <laughs> Bihun Kui store yes. that will just text you or yeah. just inform me. I'll, I'll inform Drop Aaron. us a note in one of uh, in our yeah, IG. I'll pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. I'll pay attention to that. And I, I really have to, okay, we, we, okay I'll address the, 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 the local scene in a mm -hmm. short while. I have mm -hmm. a lot to say about the local scene, but mm -hmm. I have a question for you, right? Uh, Aaron, you are a hawker sensation. Uh, there are super long queues. Uh, we have to come earlier just yeah. so that we don't run out of hawk, yeah. uh, Bihun Kui. Mm -hmm. uh, Bihun Kui runs out at two o'clock, you know, sometime even earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I read the food bloggers and uh, I know some of them, they're very legit, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that they, they get paid, you know, yep. they really say it's good, it's good. Yep. What's your secret sauce? <laughs> Two million bucks and we can talk. Hey! <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, okay. yeah, I mean, I really appreciate the bloggers coming. In. I, I'm just going to put it on the record now. As of this recording, I have not paid anybody to come. No, exactly. So, yeah. that's, that's so these right. guys, wow. are, they show up without even me knowing. Sometimes oh. I don't even know when they came. They, I, you know, Somebody just tagged me. Hey, look, you've been featured. And then, huh? I didn't even see them. Or maybe they didn't even come themselves. They have their they writers. Who, yeah. Yeah, or their writers who yeah. came. And then, um, so... So that, uh, bless their heart. Thank you very mm. much for that one. The secret sauce, uh, I think the difference between my Mi Hung uh, and the traditional ones, right? I mean, for the overseas friends, uh, it's usually a very clean soup, right? Mi Hung is very clean, but it's always just soup. Yeah. Uh, ikan bilis, uh, soya bean, then some pork bone, depending on it's a fish base or pork base uh, soup. But it's always very clean and very light. Uh, my mihun kueh is a little bit more robust as you've tried. It's somewhere in between a mihun kueh and ramen. Yeah, very unami. Uh. Uh, is that um, how you say umami? Umami, yeah. umami, very savory. Yes, so it's got a lot of stuff in it. And uh, a lot of the inspiration of how I assemble this dish is when, you know, uh, happened during uh, one of the many trips that I've been to Japan. Uh, and I got inspired like, because, I mean, who are we to argue with the Japanese about ramen, right? You know what I mean? Like, these guys are, I mean, they have the most Michelin star in the world per country, right? So they must be doing something right. I mean, they came out with umami in the first place, yeah, right? Yes. Like, who are we to argue with these guys? So um, <laughs> so I actually learned a lot of stuff. I got some ideas from them. And so the mihun kueh is different in that aspect. So of course, uh, the broth, so it's no longer a soup, it's a broth, it's thick. And of course, it's got a lot of good ingredients. Yes. And the secret, of course, there's another thing that a lot of people rave about is this wok hei that's ah, inside. How do we explain that? Wok hei, it's a bit it's burnt. Cha. 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 It's like um, the smokiness. Uh, I mean, you get this only in a really Chinese stir fry. Yes. Uh, uh, friends from the West or overseas, uh, don't confuse it with barbecue smoke. It's different. It's not like cherry wood or, or the kind of hickory kind of smoke. It's the kind of char you get out of a very strong fire uh, as you stir fry uh, in a big wok, that kind of stuff. So I don't know if you notice as a bit of that. It's not overpowering, it's there, but you can't really figure out where it came from, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Wow. Now, food aside, mm -hmm. obviously uh, having good food is very important, yeah. right? Is there any other factors that is very important when it comes to marketing your food brand? Marketing the food brand? Mm. Because you can be very good if people don't know about it, no point, right? I think um, in this climate, right, this time and age, of course, social media is very, very important. Um, but Step one, of course, you gotta have that good product. Mm. You gotta make sure your food is good. Then how you want to market it, how you want to brand it, you need to be able to, uh, how should I put it this, this way? 
create that look first. You know, what I mean, like what you want, like think of a nice catchy name like Jia Song, for example. You know, uh, uh, um, how do you want to engage your your so called customers? Yeah. Then you have all your social media stuff. So get all that ready. Uh, of course, for me, I'm fortunate. Master Chef did help. I can't deny, it, right? It does help. What do you mean by it does help? Because of the uh, the, the the brand, right? Like, oh, as in like because you are yeah, a master yeah, exactly. you already have the brand. Okay. Correct, correct. Yeah. But that is also a can be a double edged sword, you know. It can be the Achilles heel because you can entice people to come and try first because of the Master Chef brand. And like, yeah. Oh, Master Chef opened this store and you come, and then you draw the people. But if your product is not good. It backfire. It backfires very, very quickly. Even more people yeah. laugh more. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And on top of that, you are very judged. Mm. Right. They will be extremely picky. Even more picky than they would anybody normal, else. Because Correct. they say you yeah. master chef. Yeah. So they yeah. nick pick on every little thing. So if you ask me, it's a double edged sword. But if you know, if you don't have the master chef thing, and you're thinking how you wanna uh, create that brand, first of all, uh, be a little bit spend a bit of time in social media. You know build up a small little, at least a, a nice page, get some followers going. Uh, a lot of things uh, you try to show that you are, what do you call it? Manage your social media accounts properly and then give people a lot of content to read about and then, you know, draw these people in. But in the end of the day, I think you need to really let the food do the talking. Seriously. Would you say that the photos help? <laughs> oh, Picking yeah. nice pictures of your of food? Course. Of course, I, I think it does. I mean, I shot all the photos. In yeah, song. I mean, that's an yeah. unfair advantage because right? you yeah. are a commercial yeah. photographer. So I shoot all that. So, so I, you know, I designed the entire look. Yeah, I want to ask you that. What's the thought process behind the store decor and all the utensils and uh, visuals? Mm -hmm. uh, just old, no school like the old school, bro. Yeah, wow. yeah no it's really, like school, school it's school. designed the, you went to the one in Queen Street it, to really get the feel of the DNA of, um, of Your brand. the brand, you must go to Tolo Blanga. Got it, okay. Okay, because that is the flagship. That shop is legit, right? It is uh, really made of real wood, you know, and the whole creative direction was it's supposed to look like a push cart. You know, those old push cart with a yes. glass cabinet. Yes, yes, yes. And then one pop, big pot of soup, yeah. you know, that's how we used to sell stuff. And then there's a small little uh, Light. Uh, pressure lamp, you uh. know, yeah. And in, back in the day, it's like, if you turn it on, means business starts, Correct. right? And it's very straightforward. It's just mi hong kui. There's no fancy cartoon, nothing. It's just one word. You know, it says what it says. You see it from a mile away. So that was the look. But of course, the, the whole vintage look is just the frontage, the facade, right? What When you step in it, uh, it's actually a professional kitchen, mm, right? Uh, All right. the state of the art stuff, uh, up to date stuff, I would call it, right? Uh, there's no open flame in the in the entire shop. Uh, insulated boilers, you know, induction cookers, and all this stuff, and uh, a proper restaurant kitchen uh, workflow. Yeah, I see. So mm. there's also another advantage of yours, yeah. or something different, right? Right. Got it. Okay, so we need to definitely get some pictures and videos of the the vintage one. The vintage so everybody one. Can look at it. Because the one that you saw in Bugis, um, it's a little bit. Uh, we have a lot of restrictions because of the coffee shops themselves. They want to have certain look, look maintained, and of course, wood. You know, they just like oh, we don't want to use wood. It's you know, it gets wet and all that stuff. So there's a lot of um, a, a, a red tape that we can't cross. But it's very clear that the image that you're trying to bring across is something a bit more old school. Yes, you're trying yes. to bring a dish that we all like when we were young mm. and to be as authentic mm. as, as possible, right? Exactly. So that's the image that you exactly. want to create. So I guess to answer back, that, to circle back the question on how do you market it, I guess for all food brands, they need to start thinking about what's the emotions that they want to generate when, when people mm. eat their food. Mm. Maybe that would be a very good guide, do you think? Um, I mean, to be very honest, uh, uh, when I went into this, right, the social media marketing stuff or, or any form of marketing for that yeah. matter was the last thing on my mind. Wow. Not that I don't want to do it, but yeah. I simply didn't have the time to look into it mm. because we were opening the first store and I have, you know, I'm flustered and I'm like, oh, shit, you know, <laughs> panicked. They're like, oh, now we have to talk about so much food. How am I going to do this? Blah, blah, blah. And you just don't have the time. But again, fortunately for me, because of the MasterChef tag, right, uh, a lot of... Uh, people just, I mean, media outlets, they just basically picked us Curious, up. Curious, yeah. yeah. And they just started posting. And I remember thinking, oh, you know, now I have to really quickly share this post and do all this stuff. But, but I honestly didn't have time. Because when we started, we were doing, I was doing 16 hours a day, hardcore, wow. right? So by the end of the day, you, I mean, I don't care what you are. La. I mean, I'm in production, I'm in the filming industry. I always felt that 
production crew are some of the toughest people, right? Yeah. Until I met the people in F and B. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean pound for pound on these guys really you're talking about 12 hours of standing. Non-stop standing under in, the heat. Under the heat. I mean, you you have just, I mean, no more Father's Day for you, bro. Oh. Because it's so hot, right? Um, and, and, and I mean, you don't even have to cook. I will, if I draw a yellow box and I get you to stand in there for 12 hours, don't do anything, just stand straight. Yeah. I'll give you water anytime you want, but just stand straight. Don't lean on nothing. Just, it's still a torture. 12 yeah. hours is a long time to yeah, stand. It is. So imagine these guys doing all this. So uh, I was doing 16 hour days when we started. But I guess, I guess in any business, when you start off, um, the good old elbow grease is required. There's no shortcuts to that stuff. Um, so I wasn't thinking that much of it. But now I am, so I try my best to you know update a little bit of stuff, uh, listen to what people are saying, share some of these things. Um, but in the end of the day, I think I spend more effort making sure the food is Got it. Up to There's standard. a saying, right? That be so good at what you do, mm. the world loses its breath watching you do what you do. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. So yours hope, would be, you I know. Hope, I hope that comes true for me in yeah, some ways. Yeah. Maybe yours is what? Be so good at what you do, right? Mm. People ask for a second serving. There we go. <laughs> that would be best, yeah. best of yeah, business. There right? we go. There we go. What if someone comes to you now, right? a young guy? Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of young entrepreneurs who want to who want to demo in the F and B. And right. I noticed something very interesting that these young people do not mind setting up their store at a hawker. Because, you know, during my generation, mm. I'm from the 80s, right? Like, mm. huh? I mean, I work in a hawker center for mm. my cousins as well. Mm. It's a very tiring job. Correct. But i noticing young people setting up Western food stores, setting up pasta stores at a hawker. Yes. And even beer at hawker. What's happening in this whole hawker scene? Yes. Okay, these are very interesting times, like, to be honest. Yeah. Especially in this uh, COVID and all that. Um, sorry. <clears throat> especially in COVID, I... Interesting because just before this pandemic, the hawker culture is obviously uh, having some problems. <laughs> yeah, shaky. Because um, the truth is more people are retiring. The old guards are retiring more than young ones are taking over. Correct. That's, that was what's happening. And then all these people are talking about reinventing hawker food. You hear that all the time. Or oh, we want to reinvent hawker food. Reinvent. Wait, the young people saying yeah, that? Yeah, the young people. Mm. Now, uh, don't get me wrong. I think it's okay. Uh, however, I don't think that is what I want to do because it's not the food that needs to reinvent. It's the way we make this food that needs to change. Okay, It's the way we operate that needs to change because we like our food the way it is. Like past, like yeah, our food, correct. our grandma's food. Wantan yeah. mee is wantan mee already. Don't go add truffle inside. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank, okay. thank you. I, haven't, I don't know if anybody does it, but if somebody doing it, I, I mean, no offense. But I don't I'm know. Just, I see truffles in everything. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Right? So it's this or, or don't mix A and B and then call another it fusion. One, another one, mala. I see people add mala in everything they yeah, say. Yeah, mala I also do. Yeah, but, but it's like- Everything they do. Mala yun tum mien. Yeah, oh, yeah that's right, exactly. So things like, yeah, then it's then they call fusion, you know, this and that. I mean. Don't get me wrong, these are interesting mm. because if, if you were to argue, people would say that Singapore, our so-called traditional hawker food came about because there were fusion. Because our forefathers came from different parts of China, you know, like our Hainanese chicken rice, it should not be called Hainanese chicken rice, right? It should be Singapore chicken rice. Yeah. Because if you bloody go to Hainan, there's no such thing as the kind <laughs> of chicken rice we have here because we have tailored it to suit our taste. taste. And that only happens if people f do fusion, you know, like, and then we, blah, blah, blah. So I'm not saying that they are wrong. I'm not saying that it's not good, but what I prefer to do is, um, we, don't want, we don't need to reinvent the food. We need to reinvent the way we run a hawker business. That's what I think. So, which is why when we came to my business, I want to adopt stuff that the restaurants are already using. It could be a workflow, it could be equipment. And these things are actually very accessible. These are not new technology. I mean, induction. Everybody knows what's an induction, but a lot of hawkers, you'll be surprised, don't, right? Or insulated uh, uh, boiler. Uh, if you guys must know, it's, it's just a big pot, right? Like it holds 170 liters of whatever you put in it. But it's insulated. So it could be Still a rolling warm. boil inside. Yeah. But if you touch on the outside, it's lukewarm. Yeah. And once it's boiling, it shuts itself off. And because it's insulated, it keeps warm for eight, 12 hours if you cover it, right? So it's very efficient and you don't get burns. Because if you look at the old school guys, right? They have a big stock pot yeah, and then they have a one. big burner at the yeah. bottom and it's so hot, it's the flames, it's dangerous. And if you touch your, you know, this yeah. parts, it's like you but see a lot of chefs have all these burn marks burn because mark. they, when they leave the lid, it 
the steam comes up and all that stuff. So all these things can change. And then this whole how to manage your entire workflow like a restaurant. I, I mean, a hawker store is essentially a mini restaurant kitchen. Mm. It is what it is. Mm. It is small, but it has everything that, that is a needed. Restaurant have, yeah, yeah. That's a restaurant, just in a small scale. So if you you know do all your first in first out, have proper containers for every item, labelled and everything, um, then it makes it very systematic. And how does that benefit the hawker? Like when things are systematic and things have a workflow, then you become blistering fast. Ooh. Yeah. So I started doing sixteen hours a day. Because I was so flustered, there's things everywhere. And I'm like, Shit, we need to, we need to get all this declutter the whole damn thing, right? We got to make it very clean, very systematic. Get one pinch of this for one pinch of that, and then you make this, for example. And then I start making charts, right? Because I realized I can't do everything by myself, you know. And I need to make sure somebody else can do it when I'm not around. But then again, uh, I have all this training as a as a cook, but this person might not yeah. know all these things. So to simplify it. You need to itemize everything and make it into a SOP, right? So it's the same concept. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm doing for hawkers what uh, McDonald's has done for fast food, what Henry Ford has done for cars. Yeah. Because back in the day when, when somebody wanted to assemble a car, it was two or three engineers and they spent two months to assemble a car. If you want to eat a burger in the 40s and 50s, you go to a burger joint, one chef assembles your entire burger. He sweats the onions, grills the buns, you know, mm. and grills the patty, assembles the burger. It takes a lot of time. It takes, and most importantly, it takes a lot of skill. It, you're skill dependent, mm. right? But when Henry Ford went to see a slaughterhouse, I think that's how the story goes. I, don't, I might be wrong, but I think that's how it went. Uh, he saw how they slaughtered cows. And it was on a conveyor. So they, they, dis, uh, they, they dispatched the animal, they'd hang it upside down. One guy would, it's a bit, more bit lah, but drain the blood, and then a guy will cut this, and I cut. But everybody does one job, and by the end of that belt, it pops out a perfectly clean carcass, ready to go. So Henry Ford was like, "Oh man, that's great!" So instead of having two or three engineers, which is so difficult to hire because they're trained workers, I can now hire everybody. They don't need to know anything. They just need to know how to put this screw into this hole very quickly, very well, repetitively every single day and a whole line on these people. And they are not expensive because they are not skilled workers mm. and they're easy to find because anybody can do it. Oh my God, I'm, I'm getting it now. Yeah. yeah, so then that's what you want to do. As, because if you want to have the product like only I know how to do, then what if I'm sick? Yeah. yeah. And then how what about scalable. my- yeah, Exactly, then what about my next store, right? So then I just quickly, but that was already part of the plan. You know, the, the expansion is already part of the plan going in. So we simplified everything in the store. And we managed to get from 16 hours a day down to, I think, eight to nine hours. Yeah. And wait, wait, let's per, set the context. So 16 hours of work time, like yeah. a person had to produce X number of bowls, take 16 hours. Yeah. Now for the same X number of bowls, you only take half the time. Yeah. Wow. Same number of bowls. Save, save time means save money. Save a lot. All the extra time can start at another store. Yeah. So now my Teleblanga store is like, um. Guys, if you want to get the true Chia Song experience, you yes. got to go to the Telebranga store sure. because the store is the real one, original. The two staff in there are mine, really, uh, so-called my you. pioneer staff. Yeah. And um, that is the only store that is still 9 a.m. to twelve uh, to 2 p.m. And then we sell out or we close for the day. The rest of the Boogies ones are, they we run 13 hours operations, but we have two shifts of people. Got it. Mm. So you see, but because of that system I told you, it makes hiring easier. So when they interview and they say, oh, uh, I don't know, I don't have much experience doing this. I only have two questions and uh, that were asked during interview. A, are you willing to learn? Of course, everybody will say yes. B, can you cook instant noodles? <laughs> <laughs> if the answer is yes, then okay. okay. Then we can talk. I wanted to say like, can you follow instructions? <laughs> so yeah. they follow your instructions, you get a food. Yeah. But then that's the nice part about it is also because like, for example, when you're using induction and all that, you can set the temperature. It's not like gas, man. Gas, you got to turn, then you look at the flame or oh, agar agar here. Yeah. But induction, it takes, okay, you know, so explain. Yeah. Agar agar means estimate, estimate, yeah, right? It's, it's an Our estimation game, that, right? Yeah. right? You look at the flame or you, or you put a marker, you know, like, oh, this yeah. line follows. So there's no consistency. Yeah, for but then it depends on the outflow of the gas, isn't it? If you have a full canister, this marking is still stronger than if that canister was half dead. Right, think about it. It's all this fluctuating, uh, uh, you know, possible, uh, uh, what's the word? 
The little changes, right? Yeah. That makes all the, the difference. The inconsistency that's yeah. in it, you know. So the variables, that's the thing. Um, but with induction, no. You know, 1,500 watts, 1,500 1, watts. For three minutes, ding, you know, stop cooking, move. This is beautiful. I've yeah. never seen uh, uh, the hawker yeah. business that way, right? But yeah. that's also the reason why restaurants can scale. Yeah. Because they have just one head chef, but they yeah. have a system. Correct. Right? That is replicable. Correct. So if a hawker can start thinking that way, number yes. one, safety. Yes. Number two, maintenance of quality of food. Number mm. three, they have the potential to scale their business and yes. grow. Correct. And be very efficient. That means no, no, uh, we don't have any food wastage. Our food wastage is equivalent to zero. Why, why do you say food waste stage is zero? Because a lot of people, uh, again, this is difficult to explain, but we par cook our stuff, right? So we take out what we need as we need them. It's like, right? in, 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 um, sorry, in the factory world, we call it just in time. Just in exactly. time manufacturing. So I think really? it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, you don't waste. It's like, but it's, for example, if you're doing chicken rice, that's difficult because you have to think, oh, today I want to sell 20 chickens. So you have to cook in the morning. And then maybe if you don't sell 20 chickens, you're going to have two guys, you know, like, oh, you know, 18. Then we're going to do the last two chicken, you know, that kind of stuff. But we will never have this problem because we will take them out as we use them. And it's prepped the day before. Portioned nicely. Again, I say everything has its boxes. And as we need to do this, of course, we plan, okay, today 200, for example. Today, we're going to sell 600 bowls. We prep for 600. Um, but as we are going, looks like it's going to hit past 600. We have more because we, we prep two days. So two is one, one is none. Yeah. Um, and so we will never run out. I mean, we will never run out A and B, we will never have food wastage. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So I, I hope the rest of you guys listening to this, I think this will be very powerful, not just for the F&B business, but for mm. any business for that matter. Yeah. Uh, to think in terms of systems. Correct, correct. Right. That can your business run when you're not even around. Correct. Can you still produce the same standard? Yeah. Now, I, I mean, before the interview, we were just casually talking a lot about the local food scene, right? right yeah. Like, let's talk about that. Like, what, what do you think are, are some of the frustrations right now today about the local food scene? I have to pick one or do I have a few? Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> uh, well, we, we have time for three. <laughs> no. you, know, you can okay, talk I, about I, three. I have a couple of them. I mean, but to say across the entire F&B industry, um, I'll say the first one is labor. For example, mm. like that frustrates me la, because um, we always, I mean, I think everybody knows this from, it's just, it's been a problem since day one that it's hard to hire. Uh, and um, a lot of Singaporeans are not willing to pick up to do the job. Exactly. Yeah. And I'll be honest, and this is my experience, uh, Singaporeans, a lot of them very spoiled, very entitled. I literally have a girl came and said, I want to be a hawker and all that. Yeah. I said, okay, uh, may I know what is the pay you're expecting? Of course, I asked her experience. Oh, I've done a little bit in a cafe. So she's not very experienced, but I'm willing to teach. That's fine. And I asked her how much are you expecting so that we're on the same level. Yeah. Or, you know, or if you give me a number, I see whether I can meet you there. Correct. And she says 3,000. And I'm saying, excuse me, 3,000? Is you giving to me or are giving to you? <laughs> right. I mean, you have a no experience person coming and she's expecting uh, and she and she said it in such a way as though 3000 is already very minimum huh by the way you know oh. that kind of feeling and then it's very disheartening i'm like oh listen girl i i this is not a michelin star restaurant uh, you know you, you know working in a hawker store so it's a bit difficult to find labor and of course uh i feel that the certain rules and regulations also prevent a lot of people who want to come in especially the hawker scene for yeah. example uh I'm sh I shan't name the agencies, la, but uh, I would say the government sectors that are governing this whole hawker scene uh, makes it very, very difficult for young hawkers. I'll tell you it's an uphill struggle. I will tell you that everything from the bidding system, I mean, if you want to get a store in a hawker center, yeah. you have to bid for it, huh? right? It's like an auction, right? It's not ballot, my friend. Bid, that means you throw so whoever in gets the highest. Yeah, exactly. The highest bidder wins. Uh, which I find extremely strange. I don't think it's right because if I'm not wrong, you know, these agencies are, they don't want, they're not here to lose money, but they're they are not a profit-driven organization yeah. either. But what's the purpose of bidding or an auction, so to speak? Correct. Is to drive the price up, right? And then the, the and young entrepreneurs will not have the kind of correct, capital, right? Yeah, or they bite off more than they can chew. Mm. Right? Because it's, if, if, if other agencies were to follow this concept, uh, then I, for example, HDB, I tell you finish, if HDB allow bidding, I tell you, the low-income family have got no uh, house. Homeless. Yes, yeah. exactly. They will not be able to afford a house. But HDB have figured out that you know it should be based on fairness, and so they go for a ballot system, right? So it's a 
the, the luck of the draw, right? I mean, if you get it, if you get it. And I think it should be this way. It should be more controlled. You shouldn't have so much red tapes. Uh, and of course, you know, um, the price has to go down. Because I'll tell you, and this is online, so I'm, I'm not disclosing anything, right? So if you go to the certain particular website to check the last successful bid for the past couple of months, uh, there are some stores and uh, over at um, Tiong Bahru, right? That is, I think they bid for $5,000 or something like that. For a hawker? Yes, I'm not, jo I'm not even joking. So this, this champion who bid this price, if he were to hire one staff, at least he has to at least hire one person, right? You know, I'd say, and you cannot hire foreigners. Uh, you got to hire Singaporeans. Yeah. And Singaporeans are not going to work for anything less than $2,500. Let's say give her or him $2,500 plus CPF, maybe two eight, two nine, right? Out of your pocket. And then you have to have your ingredients. You have to have your, we call it the siwap, the conservancy, the one who kind of collect your bowls, right? Yeah. It's not free. And then if you want to engage somebody to wash your bowl offside, that's another 900 bucks. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, before he can roll out his shutter on the first day of his opening, <laughs> he would have been 10,000 in the hole. Hmm. Easily. Now, if you're selling mihun kueh, how many mihun kueh must you sell before you are even making a profit? That you have covered rent, yeah. overheads. You know? Well, assuming a bowl is three dollars. You go and count. One thousand, that's three hundred bowls. Yeah. No, oh my god, more than three hundred three hundred and thirty three bowls. But you sell that sales, that's not profit. <gasps> Think about oh it, god. my friend. Yeah, and that's actually yeah. just break even only. Correct. So that's why these people cannot shut down. They cannot have an off day. They cannot do half day work. They have to do a eight, nine hours, ten hour shift because they cannot close the shop. They need to make it happen. And after they do it for six months, they burn out, they're like, Shit, I don't want this life no more, and blah, blah, blah. So all this talk about supporting the hawker culture, UNESCO and all that. Yes, we want it, everybody rah, rah, but after the fact that it's not enough support, mm. you know, I'm a hawker mentor, right? This state agency uh, has, has uh, done this thing called the Hawkers Development Program. I think it's very interesting. They give you an opportunity to learn from hawkers and they get guys like us to be mentors and we nice. teach them. Okay. But after they teach them, they don't give them any opportunities to do anything. Oh, it's just a learning thing. Yeah, it's just okay. a learning. Then there are some things like incubator stores Correct. that they offer. But these incubator stores are in places that the business will not survive. Uh, you know yeah. what I mean? They're like, okay. you know, the armpit of Singapore, literally. One corner, obscure places. Or they even have places like, oh, it sounds very nice, Maxwell or Amoy Street, I'm not, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. But excuse me, it's COVID. Yeah, we we're not we, working. We're yeah, all working they, from they, home. You can't go into CBD now. These guys, you are setting them up to fail. And I'm saying this as a guy who has been through it, you know, so it's wrong. So this is one thing I really feel frustrated about, uh, you know, the, the, the inability to hire foreigners, we can't find workforce, and then all these red tapes that are making it so difficult uh, for young hawkers who wants to come up. That's one of them. Um, and I think a lot needs to be done to improve. Mm. And there's a lot of room for improvement. Let's just put it this way. And the other thing that I really have issue about, this is a little bit more personal. I don't know how to call it though. Uh, <laughs> let's call it the social media review culture. Okay, social media. Or the review, review culture, culture of, yeah. that surrounds, of, of, surrounds F and B. Um, basically, you know, people writing reviews or people giving a comment or giving a rating. Of, Correct. So, I'm not talking about my, my store, so this is generally. Yeah. Because I personally have seen a lot of um, F&B establishments that I personally like. That means like certain one tummy. Yes. Or I like, I personally want them good. But then, you know, they're always the haters and, and all that. Um, um, we are talking about these people, okay, who talks about all that. And why I think this is a problem, uh, accountability, mm. okay, I feel. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not against feedback. I love feedback. I, I treasure them, I appreciate them, but only if they fall into three uh, very important categories. Uh, food quality. Of course, if there's something wrong with the food, I need to know, okay? Thank you very much, I really want to know. Food hygiene, mm. okay? So if it's unsafe, something went wrong, I need to know. Yeah. Service, right? So if it falls into any of these three uh, oh, categories, no. great. Yeah. These to me are feedback. but. It becomes difficult when it goes into uh, the personal realm, like my personal opinion, you know, because taste is a notoriously so subjective. Subjective, exactly. What you like, somebody else might yeah. not. And when your review is based solely on your personal 
opinion, then it's very difficult to address. Yep. Right. But don't get me wrong. I, I think uh, it is still okay if you are a professional in some ways. Say, for example, you are a football, food mm. blogger, you are a food writer, mm. or even just a chef, a real mm. chef. I think that's still okay because to some extent, you know what you're talking yep. about, right? And that's how it used to be because before the days of social media, food reviews are always in magazines or in newspaper. Correct. When they, you know, by professionals. Correct, by professionals. Yeah. Food writers, food people. But these guys, but now these days, anybody who is anybody can comment. With a, anybody with a phone and a social yeah. media account. Correct, they can comment. <laughs> yeah. But my, my question is this, who are these people? For all we know, this guy can't even boil water to save his life, mm. right? Um, but they're commenting about food. Mm. That's akin to me telling Tiger Woods, that looks like a bad swing, bro. I could do this swing many times better than you. Mm. Tiger Woods turns around. So do you play golf? I never held a club in my entire life, but I know a bad swing when I see one. Does this wow. sound fair? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah it doesn't unfair. sound fair because yeah. if you don't know, you can't judge people. I feel sorry for a lot of these F&B establishments because when they do that, I mean, if it's an opinion, fine, but if they start to give reviews, what it actually does is, or give a star rating on Google, for example, it actually affects someone's business. 100% because uh, as a consumer, we actually do look at reviews. Exactly. But we would not question the review. Correct. So yeah. it affects someone's business. It undermines people's hard work that they put in just because of your own misplaced judgment. Mm. Okay. And of course, I can tell you a lot of stories. I mean, we just talked, you just tried my food today, right? Okay, let's talk about me then. There was once a person who wrote, in and say that uh, oh, your soup is disgusting. It has a burnt taste. I think your chef must have over fried the ikan bilis. I'm saying this, if that person is watching this, I'm talking to you, right? <laughs> um, uh, you know, the chef must have overcooked, uh, uh, burnt the ikan bilis. That's why it had this burnt, disgusting taste. It's very bad. You should ask him to watch out, you know? Not knowing that this wok hate is was intentional. Yeah, in, it is intentional and it's the specialty of the store. Yeah. It's like you walking into a sushi restaurant and complain that the meat is raw. I mean, you know, so it, you, you, you need to know what you're eating before you go in and shove it down your throat. At, that's one. B, the moment you talk about you can't believe being over fried and then creating this char taste yeah. that is this wok hay, right? You know for a fact this person has not a blinking clue about food <laughs> or how it's done. Because I can tell you, darling, it's a lady, I can tell you, darling, if you can get wok hey out of over frying your ikan bilis, you need to bottle that up because you'll be a millionaire. <laughs> you need to sell it by the gram. So these are the people who are making these comments. Yeah. And that's just me. So, but when I read other food establishments, I feel very sorry for them, you know, like, oh man, because I know for a fact that they are really good. Mm -hmm. And this particular person just has a different opinion. Yeah. And I feel sorry for them because it's embarrassing. They think that they, I mean, by going against the grind, they feel like maybe they're very opinionated. Yeah. But that's not. Because if everybody likes something and you're the only one who doesn't, chances are you are the weird one, right? It's the same saying, right? If you can't find the ass in the room, it's probably you. you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, so, and I don't think it's healthy. So I don't think these people should comment so much. I mean, think about the work some established I mean if it's, it's, it's within the three uh, exactly. categories exactly the three things that you yeah, just mentioned I yeah. agree but if it's just I feel it's not nice I won't go back I won't encourage anybody to go back I don't think you need to say all these things because somebody worked hard you know and most importantly last but not least I don't recall anybody asking for their opinion because if it is somebody posts a picture of their food for example mm. and I've seen this and they're just proud man. Oh, this is our food it's no different from you putting a picture of say an art piece that you have done yeah. or, or your child yeah, your yeah. baby or you know but you know what they say about babies right sometimes in the eye of the mother la, it's Correct. the cutest la. Yeah. so but but that picture of somebody's food somebody's artwork or somebody's baby is just them sharing what they are proud of yeah they are not asking for an opinion but when you come along and say that's an ugly ass painting man or you know that bowl is so I tasted it that day it's so bad I didn't want to eat it again I mean, how would you feel if I look at a picture of your baby and say, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my damn life? You know, it's just rude, right? So You, you know, that's the thing <laughs> that I feel that social media is a double-edged sword. Correct. Right? Correct. Just exactly. like you said, Master Chef, is that yes, we are given a platform. Correct. All of us are given a platform, but we need to practice discernment Correct. in our world because words have power. Yeah, exactly. It's life and death. Exactly. 
Well, that's very powerful. I mean, okay, I'm in a social media world. I mean, we do sometimes get like, we will share what we mm -hmm. what we feel about experiences, but it's very nice to hear from your point of view that, hey, every single word that you say, you know, can uplift a person mm -hmm. or can bring a person down, which is why there's a saying that if you have a chance to be kind or to be right, always mm -hmm. choose to be kind. Yeah. And uh, especially in today's world. Exactly. And that doesn't cost you anything to not have, not say certain things, for example. Don't punch down at people. Or another way to do it is public compliment, mm -hmm. private criticism. That's the way to go. So if know? I if, if I really think your mm -hmm. income is, is even, I mean, there's no basis for that, but mm -hmm. even if, if she comes from wrong, a good yeah. place, you, yeah. see, you think about it, if she has come from a good place, yeah. she would have understand that a business is tough. Exactly. I'm going to still give you a good rating. I'll, 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 I will say what I like. Mm -hmm. But the part about the burn, I'll message you privately. Exactly. And I'll say, dude, your thing is burnt. And you would have been very kind to I educate will, her. Yeah, I will reply nicely. Yeah. For sure. And I do 100% of that. If they reach out to the privately in the po uh, yes, post exactly. and ask about certain things, we will always address. But these are the people, but when I'm talking about these people, I'm talking about the one star people. Yeah, we talk intention. I yeah. always think that it's yeah. about, words is words, but what's the intent when you say all the things? Correct. And some of them are unfortunately, I mean, it happened, it happened in, uh, what's that one called? TripAdvisor many yes. years back, okay. right? When they were not accountable. So people are writing all kinds of, like different hotels uh, trashing yeah, each other. Yeah, they essentially yeah. hire writers yeah, to write correct. it. Okay. So <laughs> then they, I think they did something like, you need to show proof of stay and all that stuff. Correct. And then have a council that people know who you are. Yeah. You know, you're reachable, you're contactable. That's Correct. why you're accountable for what you say. That So they clean up TripAdvisor pretty okay. That's what and I understand. Because more trusted. Correct. Yeah. Um, but these guys, I tell you, man, uh, I'm going to share another story. There was this very, this lady who who, who wrote in privately that uh, uh, our portions are very small. It's not enough for her. So when you write to me privately, it's, it's my basic Courtesy, decency yeah. yeah to respond and i say i'm sorry you feel this way but um what you must know is our our query right if you have seen it in a, in a store it's pre-cut yeah. to a certain size yeah. uh, it's about 120 grams if you eat a bak chow mee uh, bak chow mee is uh, noodles are uh, basic noodles, yeah. uh, minced pork noodles um uh it's 100 to 110 grams okay if you got a ball of bak chow mee is like yeah. that or one time mee is like this but ours is 120 so it's really more okay um, so I, we're actually serving you more than what you will get from a standard uh, noodle shop. Um, but however, it's good to know that if you want more, you can always add noodles. It's like a, a dollar, you get more, like upsize, like, you know, upsize, supersize my, my immune grade. And, but uh, I think you are, uh, uh, I think the word I used was a big, if you are a bigger eater, that's what I use. Eh? So uh, however, if you are a bigger eater, you can, you'll be happy to know you can add noodles. Yeah, that's all size. I said. Yeah. yeah. That's all I said. Uh, this this lady took offense that <gasps> oh. the word bigger eater and she is offended because it wasn't a standard. So I'm so sorry, we'll try to do better. You know, the, the cream and proper, the goody two shoe, mm. politically correct answer. But yeah. I don't think I answered her wrongly. And what she did after that was completely crazy. So she went with her friend, right? She, she said, we, me and my friend went, blah, blah. Um, and her friend left us, because this whole conversation is a, is a private, private conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It left us a review on Google with a one star. And she said that clearly, we tried to contact the owner, but they were so rude and didn't want to take our feedback. So rude? Yes. That's not rude. Hmm? That's just telling yeah. reply. Yeah. So she said yeah. that uh, we suggested that she's big la, or whatever. La. That's I'm, overly sensitive. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I can't, you can't, I can't stand people who are extremely opinionated, but easily bruised, you know? You know, actually, Aaron, <laughs> you, you really rightfully mentioned something. You see, today we, 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 I mean, the whole title of this show is about how to market a brand. And mm. I've learned from you that you jolly well better make sure your food tastes good, yeah. right? Mm. But there's a lot of external forces as well. I mean, the regulation, mm -hmm. that's when we talk about mm -hmm. it, right? Mm -hmm. And learning how to create a system. But actually, our food can live and die by reviews. Yes, yes, yes. I've seen people can get cancelled because of, you know, some stuff they said. Um, so how can we protect ourselves? So if we're going to start a brand. Uh, uh, you know? I think it's just, uh, you need to be zen as hell, right? Uh, you just need to just focus on your work and make sure you churn out quality stuff. That way you're kind of bulletproof, right? Because you got to make sure you got yourself covered and make sure your food is good. Then you know you are okay in a good spot. Anybody who doesn't like it, like I said, this person is a personal taste. Right, but if anybody who wants to put you down for the sake of putting you down, I think yeah. you just need to know when to just you know, you you can't please everybody. 
and and just to add on to what you say, right? There is, I mean, there's this rule that yeah. there will always be ten percent of the market that will yeah. love you, yeah, for who you are, mm-hmm. whatever you do. Mm-hmm. But there will also be a ten percent who will hate you, regardless of how hard you yeah. try. The magic is in the eighty mm-hmm. percent that who are sitting on a fence, and yeah. your job is just to win them over. That's nice, and that's good enough. Yeah, that's right? good enough. Right. So, but and, and another point to also add is I, I've interviewed yeah. somebody who teach about mental wellness. She says this to me. She mm-hmm. said that whenever you re- receive criticism, mm-hmm. it's like Velcro to your mind. Mm-hmm. But when you receive compliment, it's like Teflon mm-hmm. in your mind. It mm-hmm. slips away. Yeah. So uh, we tend to remember the negative more. And I guess what you just yeah. said to us is that there will be, mm-hmm. but we need to understand that there are a few, but if we keep focusing on it, it amplifies. Yep. And the first few is going to hit you pretty hard. Oh, because it's, yeah. yeah, but once you get used to it, I mean, it's like any celebrities, right? When they first having people say stuff about them, I'm sure it affects them as well. Yeah. Their publicists will say, don't you dare reply. But after a while, they probably get used to it. And then, like you said, you can't win everybody over. Yeah. Um, there will The haters will hate. Um, but just concentrate on doing a good job, you know, which is why you're here. And um, just make sure you don't fall on your end, which is producing bad stuff. You know, like if your food is really bad, then you really have to work on it. So listen to the, pick the advice that you want to listen to. Pick the feedback that you want to listen to. I love you that. And feel- also the source of the feedback. Yeah, correct. You know, you need to filter some of this stuff. If not, it drives you insane, man. I love that. Oh yeah. my God, that's a, that's a great way to kind of put a pause to our interview. Yeah. Do you know what? It's so nice chatting with you. It's so easy. Yeah. Like you're very well-spoken. Okay, uh, for it, Abing, not bad. I think for, uh, I yeah, I, mean, okay. I saw on the internet, people call you the Abing chef, right? Yeah. But you're very well-spoken and it's been very enjoyable talking to you. I don't know, you. maybe I just watched a lot of shows. But a lot of shows. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't even have all levels. Uh, so I, I don't know how I got this way, but yeah, but Thank you so much. Yeah. In closing, so I just want to drop in two fun facts about our guest today, mm. Aaron. Mm-hmm. So you don't see him, uh, you know, like he is a chef, he's been a master chef. But do you guys know that he's actually a commercial photographer? And I found out that he was actually featured on BBC, uh, crying out loud, mm. for, as the wildlife photographer of the year. Mm. He has dived with sharks and crocodiles, even wrote two books on underwater diving. In fact, he has a shark yeah. on, on his t- shark tattoo on himself. Oh, there we go. Right, so as a final question, has these two passion played a part in your entire culinary success? Mm, I think one thing is photography has taught me to be very particular about details. The devil is in the details, right? Creative people, I mean, if you are not at least a little bit OCD, you have no business being in the creative industry. Okay. Think about it. If something that is obviously ugly as hell is okay <laughs> to you, then you have no business being in this industry. <laughs> okay. So um, being a photographer, uh, you know, being a director, uh, DOP and all that, we are looking at light, you know, very precise things. We zoom in a hundred times and look at small little thing, you know, can we fix this hair? Can we do that? You know, can we try this look again? Can we, you know, we're always improving and very particular. So it's a perfectionist thing, right? It doesn't help that I'm Virgo as well, so. <gasps> you're Virgo. Yeah. Oh, your birthday so, is around the corner, just over. Uh, yeah, uh, 29th of August. Note it down, guys. Huh? Yeah, 29th August. Yeah. <laughs> it's over. Uh, voucher, vouchers or cash <laughs> oh, will be oh, very okay. nice. I'll give you my pay now. Uh, we'll visit him in uh, yeah. Tolo Blanca. Yeah, so I think that attention to details um, is what helps me a lot in this FMB. Although I, I know it sounds very far apart, but if you look at the mihun kue, especially have, having eaten it just now, right, you realize that every single component has love in it. For example, the of course the broth we all know, the noodles hand torn we know, the bar chow. The bar chow is a very uh, oh by the way is there thing, right? Nobody actually put a lot of effort into bar chow. A lot bar of chow. Explain English. Bar chow means means meat. Ah, means meat. Means okay. meat on the top of the yeah noodles. the small small meat yeah, yeah. yeah. All, that nobody really care much about it it's usually just boiled in the soup and th- thrown on top of the noodles but if you eat our bar chow our minced meat it's very tender it's been brined it's been seasoned the meat slice the pork slices which again is like people just boil it and then pop on that's it get out of here ours is very tender again brined and seasoned so each component is good enough on its own that's what we want to do, right? Every single component is on its own a rock star. So that's the attention to details. I think I'm trying to explain like every little thing. So same thing for the branding, same thing for the how the store looks. You know, my ops manager is not one such person. He's a operations guy. 
So he bought a pink color mop. I nearly died. La. <laughs> <laughs> why? You know, then he said, but why? It's a mop. I said, but the entire kitchen is stainless steel. Yeah, it's something called pink. <laughs> yeah, if it's not black, white, gray. or gray or silver, it should not be in here. Nice, okay. Then he asked, but uh, then I look at him, do you see a pink color mop in Ting Tai Fung's kitchen? When you can see it's glass, yes, right? Yeah. Do you see it in Ting Tai Fung's kitchen? Yeah. No. So please, take it home. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the photographer, director speaking, okay. not the chef in a sense. Yes. Oh, I'd want things this way. It's attention um, to detail, right? Yeah. Maybe a bit difficult to swallow in the beginning, but once you get a hang of it, I mean, I mean, people around you, then they know how you work and the results that comes along, then they understand why it needs to be done this way. And the passion for sharks. What about that? You are oh, extremely, I mean, crazy. so passionate you have a shark on you. And uh, you are also involved, uh, you're a pioneer and ambassador of an anti-shark finning campaign. Yes. And I see very popular people like Jackie Chan, yes. Maggie Q. They are that, that's a crazy story that I want like to share. Please. I mean, using your platform to Please. at least give a message. And every time I have an opportunity to talk about sharks, I would do it. Um, I've been a diver for 20 odd years. I've been yeah. going out to sea all my life, right? As a, as a child, I've been fishing, you know, just happy to be in the ocean. Um, sharks, I would tell you right now, are the most misunderstood uh, uh, creatures. Creature. One of the most misunderstood ones. And the problem is this, why are sharks so important in the ocean? Because sharks are the apex predators, right? You know, if you learn in school, right? the Yes, the triangle. Pyramid, triangle, pyramid of life and all that stuff. Um, so the, the, apex predator, the apex predator plays a very important role because everything else is in line with them, hmm. right? They need to weed out the, the, the weak ones. ones and you know, all these things, natural selection, yada, yada. So that's what sharks do. And if you take around, take away the apex predator of any ecosystem, it's going to have devastating effect, right? And you know, uh, this Dr. Sylvia Earle, which is a very famous biologist, once said that, you know, no blue, no green, because whether we like it or not, our planet is 71% ocean. It's strange that we call her mother earth when she's so much water, water right? Oh. Well, to give you an idea of how much water that is, you can take all the continents on Earth, squeeze them together, throw them in the Pacific Ocean, you still have another 10 to 20% of ocean left to spare. That's how much ocean there is. More men has gone to the surface of the moon than people have gone to the bottom of the ocean. So we know so very little about it and we need to protect it because it is the lungs of our planet. It creates all this water that we drink. It, it nurtures the rainforest that cleans our air and everything, the whole thing is the ocean. And sharks play a very important role. And the problem why it's important for us as Asians, because we are the bunch of monkeys Shark who are soap. destroying them. Yeah. We are talking about 70 million sharks a year, slaughtered, okay? Um, not for the whole carcass, not for their meat, just for their fins. Yeah. A lot of times they are cut off alive and they're thrown back into yeah, the and ocean. Yeah, it's very cruel because sharks actually breathe by moving. Exactly, so shit, exactly. No, I, 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 my sister is a diver, so. Ah, exactly. Uh, Cool. Yeah, so they actually drown. That's what's happening because sharks, unlike a lot of most species of sharks, not all sharks, uh, doesn't have that muscle in the gills that pumps water like a regular fish. So in order to breathe, they are always swimming. When they swim, they open their mouth and the air, uh, the water basically goes in and it breathe. aerates the gills and that's how they breathe. But without their fins, um, they can't do that and they sink. And as they're sinking, uh, a lot of fish will peck away at the wounds that were the fins. And basically they will sink to a point whereby, you know, the pressure itself will, in, and will destroy cool. this animal. Uh -huh. um, and it's just very cruel. And all this for a bowl of soup that is completely useless because shark fin is actually cartilage. It has the nutritional value of your nails because you can chew your nails and it'd be the same thing. It doesn't add any taste to the shark no, fin soup No, it doesn't. Anyway, it's the right? broth that gives the taste. Yeah. If anything, when we eat shark fin soup, we always add vinegar, right? Yeah. And you know how the traditional came, uh, the tradition, tradition came about because when we sometimes we swallow bone, right? In old days, you drink vinegar to soften it. Yeah? Yes, yeah. <gasps> That's mm. how it came about. Mm. Because the original shark fin is so, it's cartilage, it's stingray. You know, the stingray yes, bone, the yes. soft bone. Correct. Same thing, stingray and sharks are the same family. So if you eat stingray and this whole piece of thing, yeah. and you chew it or you dry it yeah. in the sun, and then you boil it in the broth, that's shark fin soup. That's the same component. But because of that, um, we murder 70 million each year out of profit and fear, uh, and the misinformation, and people think sharks are dangerous. And I'll tell you, I've dived to sharks, thousands upon thousands of sharks. I've been to Fakarava. That's a real place. 
in in French Polynesia. It's called Fakarava. Oh wow! Yeah, it's um, <laughs> uh, one of the largest concentration of sharks uh, uh, in one channel. A thousand, you dive with thousands of sharks. I fed four meter tiger sharks uh, this close. And I will tell you now, if these guys were men eating monsters of the movies. I won't be sitting be here, here with you guys, man. Yeah. I mean, he farts, I die. You know, he doesn't <laughs> have to do anything. It's a, he's an apex four meter of pure muscle with a very mean business end. The eyeballs are about this far apart, right? It's a big fish. The mouth is this big. Gosh. It's a big, big animal. It's just a very big animal. Uh, I've got a lot of pictures of me close like that. We'll get some of that. We'll get some yeah. pictures. And, and, you know, I don't feel threatened at all. These guys clearly know we are not the food. They are smart. They are not stupid. They have feelings. They have characters. I'll tell you, a couple of years back, I shot for a shelter, home, uh, uh, a pet shelter for dogs, right? Because, and I came out, no, I didn't come out with the idea. I suggested that, you know, we should take pictures of all these dogs up for adoption so that, you know, nice portrait so that so it, people yeah, want yeah, to we'll adopt them. So I went to this shelter. I will, I'm, I, I don't kid you not, when I went into the shelter and a lot of these dogs are mistreated, right? They abuse dogs. They are Singapore specials. They're big boys and they have a fear of humans. So when I went in, some of them growling and I'm in a cage with this big animal, right? And I'm more afraid, I'm more nervous with these. And I know dogs, I've, I've had dogs all my life, but with these dogs, I'm like, Shit, man, you know, it's a bit dangerous. You know, you gotta be careful here, right? But with the sharks, man. Wow, what an irony. Yeah, it's an irony and, and people say that they are. I think Jaws kind of ruined it for us. Yeah, I mean, Spielberg has famously said if, if he had a choice to go back in time to fix one thing, he wouldn't make Jaws. Yeah, 1976. I didn't know that. Yeah, but yeah I think we're that was need, the reason. We're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> That's what. Wow. Uh, but Jaws, yeah, it created fear in a whole generation that went on and on and just people thinking that sharks are just out to Many kill. Animals. Yeah, But even if they were, like, let's just put it this way. Uh, the truth is even if they were it is their home it's not like they came onto the beach grab you and pull you in you know <laughs> you went into the water and who are the people always get into trouble i'm going to say this if i have surfer friends i'm sorry um, but they're always a surfer the f uh, spear fishermen these are the two main groups of people who get into trouble with sharks and you ask me why it happens let me ask you a simple question what is for example great whites great white sharks and uh, maybe uh, tiger sharks right they have problems with the surface why? Now think about it. What is the main prey item for great white shark? Seals, sea lions, right? You know, these guys. Now, if you are a surfer, on the surface, you're on a cigar shaped uh, <gasps> uh, board and you have your hands on the side. It looks like a seal. Yeah. And you must understand there is no knowledge in instinct. If you throw a ball, the dog will chase it. Yes. Why the dog chase the ball? What is he going to do with the ball? He doesn't know what to do with it. He brings it back to your throat again. But why does he like it? Because it's the chase. And he has gotten it, your dog has gotten it from the ancestry days of being a wolf, a hunting which is dog. hunting a rabbit or a rodent or whatever. So you throw the ball, it chases. What does it do with the ball? It doesn't really know. A shark, there's no knowledge in instinct. When they see something dart across, looks like a prey item, they go for it. They bite it. And the truth is, a lot of these surfers survive. All right, they swim back. Maybe they lose an arm or leg. It's very morbid. Those who don't survive, usually because they bled out, right? Mm. The arteries are cut and then they Because the shark bite and realize yeah. it's not and then the and shark they just left. Eat. Yeah. Because if the shark had wanted to finish you and eat you as yeah. food, he would swim around and he will wallop you down like yeah. in one go and you, they won't even, you won't even get a body, right? Mm. You just get a piece of surfboard or that suit, neoprene floating around. But most people, or at least the bodies are recovered. They die after the trauma, uh, bled out, but not consumed. Very few that I know of is consumed entirely. You, could, you couldn't find the guy. So it's all a, a case of mistaken identity for the actual attacks. But and again, I, like I said, uh, we're in their home. You know, we can't just go to a rainforest in Borneo and say bloody orangutans shouldn't live here. Yeah. You can't. Yep. And I will say protect all the animals, even the not so cute ones. Mm -hmm. Because it's very easy to hide behind the panda. Oh, you're so cute. The dolphins. Yeah. Oh, do, 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 the tuna. Oh, do, do, do. But when you see a shark, there's teeth and all that. Like, oh, it's bad. So uh, all the animals have the right to live. They're, they're here for a reason. Wow, this is beautiful. I'm so glad I asked you that question. I mean, it's totally not related to our topic, yeah. but I just yeah. thought that that's a part of you. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm going to take a, and enjoy some of the pictures later to you know 
books. Aaron brought two books. So with the finish and with Finn's thing, it's very interesting as well because yeah. when I'm a, as a photographer, I wanted to do a campaign, right? I'm yeah. like, I want to do something. And then I realized at the time, a lot of the shark and uh, awareness uh, campaigns are all, always showing all the facts like a bloody shark, like shark fin blood, you know, gore. And I just realized as an advertising photographer, people tend to shy away from blood and gore. Most people, normal people, okay. Um, in the end, in advertising, there's two things that sell, sex and beauty, right? So think about it. What does a certain singer has to do with Pepsi, for example, or Coke? Mm. Nothing, you know, but if this guy drinks it, maybe I should. Yeah, right? by so, association. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of people that needs to understand these things are not people like you and I, because we are well informed like yeah. about sharks. But people we need to convince are people like my folks, you know, who have never been to the ocean or people who never relate to the ocean, let alone a shark. So, but if they can't relate to a shark, they can at least relate to Jackie Chan. Mm. So I came up with the idea of, we're gonna do a series of black and white pictures. Um, and it started locally with a few, if I remember, I think Gurmit Singh was one of the first few guys. Um, then when we shot there, I said, it's gonna be black and white, cover your mouth any way you want it, I don't care, but show your character, who you are. Um, so we did a few pictures with some of the uh, so-called artist friends that I have worked with over the years. And so they just did whatever they do. So, and then we came out with this idea called Finished with Fins. Finished with Fins. And then we came out with the first few pictures and then it kind of it kind of uh, had a momentum of its own. So other artists saw it and they wanted to get wanted involved. To part of yeah. It. Yeah. And so we have all the A-listers. We have Zoe, you know, um, some people we can't because of certain uh, agreements with other brands, but Everybody basically came along and then it went to Taiwan. And then we had, um, we worked with corporate companies. So like DHL, uh, even the boss, like the, the CEO uh, of the region came down and said that anything that they, of the function, or any, you know, D&D or, or things that they ship around, will not have shark, shark fin. fin. Yeah. And then uh, hotels came along, Hilton. Um, so we have all these corporate people who came as well, athletes, politicians. Uh, and then it, then it went to, to Taiwan and I still went to Taiwan to shoot, but then I realized it got very big and I can't do, I mean, I would like to sh shoot all these celebrities, yeah, exactly. right? but uh, it's not about me or my portfolio. Yeah. So I said, you know, to make it work, I need to give it to somebody and I uh, handed, handed it over to uh, Shark Savers, who is a proper NGO. And then um, they allocate whoever is there in that country to Local shoot Local photographers. It. Yeah, mm. with this template Style. yeah, mm. that we have. And then that's how we got to Jackie Chan and then- Maggie Q. Maggie, yeah, a lot yeah. of folks. Then I, then I, I kind of stepped back and I think uh, it's, it's become bigger than me. So then I just let it do its stuff. And uh, but over the years, uh, shark fin consumption in, in, in Asia uh, has dropped by almost seven, uh, 70%. Well done. Yeah. You know, in closing, uh, my final question to you is this, like everything you touch seemed to grow. <laughs> yeah. You know, your photography, yeah. Yeah, and then you got featured in BBC mm -hmm. and then the shark thing, the mm -hmm. shark campaign, mm -hmm. it grew to mm -hmm. a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And then you cooking, mm -hmm. got into MasterChef, now you have six stores. What do you think is that, what do you think is that one thing that, that secret, I mean, we talk about secret sauce, but is there that one thing that you have that allow you to be able to have this minus touch? I think without doubt, I know it sounds like a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason because people repeat it enough for it to become for a For like cliche. a wisdom, yeah. like first yeah. principle, what would that be? I would say the key word is passion. Yeah. Because you can't, you can't shit yourself with all this. You can't bullshit your way through it. You cannot do anything well if you're not passionate about it. If it's just a job job, then you're just gonna do your job. And there's a lot of people, even my friends, say, oh, I love my job, I love my job. I think it's a bit overrated when they say it. I will say you like your job, you don't necessarily love your job. My first question would be, if your boss says, I'm not gonna pay you no more, would you show up for work? And you, most people say, hell no, of course not. Then you don't love your job. Because if I'm not paid, I'd be still taking photographs. I'd still be cooking, maybe not for people, but I'd still be cooking. That's passion. That's what you mean by, I love my job. You don't love your job, you kind of like it enough, right? So the point is find what you like and make it into a business for yourself. I'm sure you enjoy what you are doing. Oh, I love it. Exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. And even if I say, I'm not gonna pay you no more, you will still be doing a lot of these things yeah. for whatever reason, yeah. just in case somebody wants to watch it, somebody wants to listen, because that is you, this is your stage, this is your 
passion. So if you find it, whatever it is, then go for that one. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. That is... Aaron, all right? I'm going to yeah. call him Shark Boy next time. All right, baby. <laughs> Better than Mihong Kui Boy, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much. And yes, I pleasure, really sincerely man. wish you all the best. Thank you very uh, much. For what you do. Yep. And hopefully one day we get to see more young people yes. in the hawker scene. Yes. Uh, and that, you know, everyone supports this culture because yes, hawker is a very big part of us. Correct. Uh, just a shout out. I mean, as in like, if you guys out there want to get into the hawker scene and they want, you guys really inspired and really want to learn and do something, uh, come talk to me. I can give you advice. Or if you want to join our team, uh, you can learn a lot of stuff from us. Uh, just just reach out to us in our Facebook. Awesome. Or, I will, I will uh, collect all your social media all, handles. handles. I'll put yeah. it in my show notes. Great. But give us one right now. What's the easiest? I mean, there'll be. I guarantee there'll be people who reach out to you or take this interview. Hmm. Um, you know, how do they reach out to you to say thank you? For okay. This? Uh, if it's just going to be for the hawker stuff, uh, then you just go to Jia Song. Okay. J I A K. S O N G. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, for me, if you want to ask about photography or some personal advice, it's really just me. Then it's uh, Aaron Wong. Dot S G. Super. On on uh, I G. Or you just hang out in Telo Blanca. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, yeah. Aaron. Good Hope to, to see you again. again. Cheers. Cheers, buddy. Cheers, man. So this is Aaron Wong, and uh, I I got so much takeaways from him. I think. The two big takeaways for me. The first one is to cultivate a portfolio of passions. Um, you know, and it, it can be very disparate, but you know, sometimes what Steve Jobs says is true, right? That the dots don't connect until you look backwards. So uh, start paying attention to what you truly love. And I, I like what he said, you know, if you don't get paid money for it, will you still do it? If you do, that's a passion. And once you have this whole portfolio of passion, go develop it, spend time at it, clock the hours because you've got a potential, you know, to be a master in that craft or in that passion and to be so good at it that the world cannot ignore you. I think that's the biggest takeaway for me uh, from my episode with Aaron. And so if you guys love hawker food, you love Bihun Kue, uh, you know, from Singapore, uh, do go check him out, say hi to him, tag him, you know, support the local food because that's how we can keep that culture going. If you love this interview, we do this every single week on YouTube and you can hit the subscribe button, switch on the bell notification and I'll see you guys at the next video.